Amen. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord, for you will find peace, joy, happiness, and a great reward. Come on and praise God with me this morning. I'm Jasmine Smothers, and I'm the lead pastor here at Atlanta First United Methodist Church in downtown Atlanta. We welcome those of you who are with us in the sanctuary this morning and those of you who are worshiping with us online. It is indeed the day that the Lord has made, and I am so glad to see you today. Today we kick off our 175 year celebration of ministry of Atlanta's first Protestant church. You are in the place where it, on September 1st in 1870, the cornerstone was laid for the 180 sanctuary of what was then First Methodist Episcopal South Church. This sanctuary of a grand Gothic design was the second permanent home of the church following the 1848 Wesley Chapel. It was built where the Candler Building now stands at the intersection of Peachtree Street and John Wesley Dobbs Avenue. The 1870 sanctuary was vacated in 1903 when this, our current sanctuary, was sold, was built, um, when the land was sold to Asa Candler, who you'll know is the founder of the Coca-Cola Company. The Candler building was completed in 1906 and was the tallest building at the time. Also, this week in the history of Atlanta First, on September 2nd, the bell of Wesley Chapel, being the only church bell in Atlanta to survive the war, told to announce the surrender of the city to General Sherman. So today we have a lot to celebrate. A lot in these 170 years God has done with us and through us, and we can't be more excited than to celebrate the Holy Ghost today. Amen? Well, let's get to worship. I'm going to introduce to you our preacher in just a few moments, but let's get to worship this morning by standing together and singing our hymn of praise, Hold to God's Unchanging Hand. The lyrics are on page six in your worship guide or can be found on the screens if you're in the sanctuary or online. Let us stand and praise God together. Thank you.
cannot make even one step, even one breath without the unchanging hand of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Just a moment of personal privilege before we continue in worship today. Um, those of you who worship with us regularly will know that I have been on sabbatical for the last month. And I have to tell you, I have missed worshiping with you in this place. So it is so glad to be, I'm so glad to be back with you this morning and blessed to get to worship with each and every one of you. I want to invite you this morning to participate in one of the most important things that we do in the church, and that is to welcome souls to be a part of the family of faith, the body of Christ, through this vessel called Atlanta First United Methodist Church. I want to invite our new members to come forward this morning, uh, Lindsay, Sanguan, Melanie, um, and anyone else who feels that the Lord is leading them to join with this family of faith this morning. And meet me right here at the altar rail, and we will welcome you into the life of the church. I feel like we're, you've already been working for a long time. Amen. <laughs> Lindsay, you've been a part of this congregation since you were in college at Spelman. And Melanie, you are an integral part of our Wednesday night small group and our AV ministry. We wouldn't have AV up many Sundays if it wasn't for you. And San Juan, we're so happy to have you here and working as our intern this fall as you continue at the Candler School of Theology. It is my privilege as your pastor to welcome you to Christ Holy Church. And we begin by asking you to remember who you are and whose you are as a part of the body of Christ. We don't do this because there are words printed in the hymnal or in the bulletin that tell us that these are the things that we're supposed to say every time we welcome new people to the church. Amen? We do this because it grounds us in our faith with God. They are not just words on a page. They are a covenant, a commitment to be who God created you to be and to do what you say that you are going to do as a part of being the body of Christ. So, on behalf of the whole church, Turn around, look at all these people, and wave to the people who are online, because there are a bunch of people online this morning, all right? You can take your mask down for just a second so they can see you, because most of these people have never seen you without a mask on. <laughs> on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? Reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin. If you do, say, I do. I do. Do you accept the freedom and the power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, races, and nations. If so, say, I do. I do. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in this world? If so, say, I will. I will. Now, Atlanta first. 
Well, you who sponsor these candidates, because each and every one of you have a responsibility to Lindsay, Melanie, and Sangwon. Each and every one of you have a responsibility to help them do what they just said they will do, because you made that same promise. So will you support and encourage them in their Christian life? If so, say, I will. Now, congregation, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, say, we do. We do. Okay, did you hear that? You just promised God that you reaffirm your rejection of sin, that you're going to do everything in your power today and in the days ahead to reject sin in this world and to be committed to the mission of Christ. So will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and your life and include these persons now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to Christ. Let us join together in professing our Christian faith as it is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. All right. You guys turn around because they have something they want to say to you. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And if so, say, I will. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do everything that you can do to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and protect, perfect them in love. Congregation, we give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ, and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Atlanta First, friends, 
Whether you're in the sanctuary or all across the world through the internet, let us welcome the newest members of Atlanta First United Methodist Church, Melanie, Melanie Long, Sangwon Kim, and Lindsay Mitchell. Let's welcome them together. Lindsay, Melanie, and Sangwan, if you will join me at the door at the end of worship today, they, uh, Atlanta First has a great way of welcoming our friends, and we are so glad to have you as, this, at, as a part of this body of Christ. We are so grateful for how you have already been at work and how God is already using you to grow this community and to transform it for good. Amen. 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 You may be seated. All right. Uh, <laughs> this is the time that we come to pray. And it's one of the most sacred times in the worship service. And before we come to pray this morning, I want to introduce you to our preacher. I became aware of this preacher high school. <laughs> oh my goodness, has it been that long? Wow, in high school. And he has been a blessing to my life since high school. Dr. Gregory C. Ellison II is the, the proud product of the city of Atlanta. And I thought that it was so fitting to have him to kick off our 175 year celebration today because of how he loves this city and because of his commitment to this city. He has graduated from the Princeton Theological Seminary as a presidential scholar where he received his master's degree and PhD in pastoral theology. He has returned to the Emory, the Candler School of Theology as the associate professor of pastoral care and counseling. He has been awarded and awarded and awarded and awarded and awarded. And I think, friend, I am most proud of your work as a major for justice in this city and literally all over the world. You just got back from Brazil where you are teaching what you are teaching us here through fearless dialogues and this movement for justice. He is an incredible scholar of the theologian Howard Thurman, and he practices what he preaches through his passionate perspective on justice, his deep roots in the city that we love, and his forward-thinking approach to local church ministry. And I cannot think of a better voice to kick off this celebration of 175 years. In just a few minutes, it is my honor and privilege to welcome to this historic pulpit at Atlanta First United Methodist Church, the Reverend Dr. Gregory C. Ellison. Let's please stand as we welcome you to Atlanta First. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to remind you as we begin this week together that you have committed to worship God, to serve people, to grow together, and to engage the city of Atlanta and beyond. There are so many opportunities for you to worship, serve, and grow this week through the ministries offered through Atlanta First. And don't forget that this week we kick off our grow groups. Our grow groups are our special uh, Christian education groups 
groups, there's something for everybody. Grow groups meet on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. They are online, and the Thursday group also meets in person. So there is no excuse for you not to be in a grow opportunity uh, beginning this week and next week as we move forward together. As we go to God in prayer, we remember today Mrs. Virginia Howard, who went to be with Jesus last Sunday on August 21. We will celebrate Miss Virginia's life together in a few weeks. Sarah, I'm so glad to see you here today. Uh, Granny has meant so much to us. I believe that Miss Virginia was our oldest active attending member of the congregation. And uh, this congregation will be forever grateful for her. We would not be who we are without Miss Virginia and without her commitment to service in this city. And I don't believe that there's a better way to honor her than to work this week to connect with our ministry partners um, after worship today and to do be the hands and feet of Christ in this city and beyond. That was what Miss Virginia did every single day. When I visited her, what, two weeks ago now, um, she kept saying to me over and over again, I don't like laying in this bed. You know I have to be busy. I have to be at work. I have to be doing what Christ created me to do. What a legacy. What a legacy she lives. For those of you who are visiting with us today online or in person, I want to let you know that you are welcome to worship in whatever way you feel led. Because it's a little bit quiet in here for me today. I know I've been away, but it's, it's a little bit quiet in here. <laughs> so let us go to God in prayer, lifting up all of those who are on our prayer list today, all of those uh, who wish they could be in this house of worship today and celebrating the life of Virginia Howard. You are invited to pray physically distance here at the altar rail. And there are prayer cards available at the doors via the ushers. You may email your prayer concerns to prayer at atlantafirstumc.org. Whatever you do, let's go to God in the way that God, that you speak best to God. Gracious and almighty God, we are so grateful that you have seen fit to wake us up this morning and start us on our way. 
We're grateful, oh God, like our ancestors used to say, that you did not allow our beds to become our cooling boards, and you did not allow our sheets to become our shrouds, oh God, but you sought fit to blow the breath of life into us, oh God, and for this we say thank you. We say thank you because you did not have to do that, oh God. We say thank you that you saved us from ourselves, oh God. We say thank you that you saved us from our foolishness in this world, oh God. We say thank you, oh God, that you continue to save us from COVID and cancer, from diabetes and all the other diseases that just seem to keep coming, oh God. We thank you, oh God, that you have been at school with our children and our adults. We thank you, oh God, that you have been with our grandparents and our parents. We thank you, oh God, that you have walked with us and talked with us, that you have never left us nor forsaken us. We thank you, oh God, that you continue to be God, that you are God all by yourself and that you do not need our help. You thank you, we thank you, oh God, that even before we cry out that we need you, that you are already ahead of us, that no situation in life catches us, catches you off guard, oh God. So, Lord, now we come to, to ask you. We come to ask you to continue to be with us, oh God. To continue to build us up, to allow your Holy Spirit to pour out on us, oh God, to make us more like you, to continue to take us as clay, oh God, and mold us so that we might be more like your son, Jesus Christ. Give us hands and feet that work for you, oh God. Give us hearts and minds that are only after you, oh God. Allow us to be your agents of love and justice in this world. Make us be your instruments of healing as we grieve and as we try to get well, oh God. We lift up all of those who are on our prayer list. We lift up Gerald, Stacy, and Claudia Harris. We lift up Ed and Ann Nelson, oh God. We lift up Wayne and Danny Pierce. We lift up Jim and Ruth Richardson. We lift up Les Scarborough and Flo and Dr. Bob Smith. We give thanks that Dallas Terrell and Dorothy, Dorothy and Turnipseed are among us today, oh God. We give thanks for Hubert Davis and the Adams Williams family. We give thanks, oh God, that you continue to provide so that we might build affordable housing right here at 360 Peachtree Street. So Holy Ghost, have your way in this place today. Have your way through all of these computers and televisions and phones, oh God. Have your way in us and through us. Don't leave us the way we are right now, but stretch us and grow us so that we can make this world more like the world you created it to be. And Lord, we ask that you would bless this preacher, that you would use the word that you have already given him. Use your word, oh God, to strengthen us and to irritate us so that we might continue your work right here on Peachtree Street and beyond. 
And Lord, we'll be ever so careful to give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise as we pray this prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, choir. Lead us on.
Amen. Lord, sanctify all of us. Lord, sanctify us in our giving as we come to give to God through our tangible resources. We come giving back to God a portion of what God has so generously given unto us. We come acknowledging that everything we have is a gift from God. And it is our responsibility to turn those gifts back to our community so that we might feed those who are hungry, clothe those who are naked, be with those who are in prison, those who are in hospitals and nursing homes. And we cannot do that unless you give generously. You are invited to give through the blue baskets that are near the doors if you are here in the sanctuary or you can give online at atlantafirstumc.org slash give. You can give via text, cash app, text to give, or by texting um, the numbers that are in the bulletins or on the screens. We give generously to God because God has been so generous unto us. So let us stand together and praise God for the gifts that God has given. Maybe sit in. Oh 
good to finally see you. <laughs> it's good to finally see you. Reverend Smothers, it's good to be here with you. As you uh, shared, we've been rocking together since high school. Uh, I am so grateful that you have extended, extended this opportunity for me to uh, kick off this celebration campaign and that you entrusted me to preach. Uh, we, we had a long talk about this. I don't get invited to preach very much, uh, so I hope I have something to say that's worthwhile. Um, I am so grateful for these music educators. They were in the back talking, uh, swapping stories about teaching classes of 100 people. Uh, I know that ain't easy, uh, and so thank you all for getting us ready for worship this day. I'm also grateful to my friend Norman up top, uh, Stephen, who has helped us get everything together, and to you, my friends. There are a lot of family members here, uh, my mama and wife and daughter and son, my brother and sister and nieces and friends from near and far. I am so grateful that you have chosen this space to worship on this Sunday morning. I was raised in the United Methodist Church. I was the pastor of a Presbyterian church. And I was born, uh, as I said, Methodist, but I was ordained Baptist. And in the Baptist tradition, uh, there would be a moment before the sermon where they would say, there is a word from the Lord. So as we prepare for this word that will come from Philippians chapter 1, I was thinking about what does it mean to move forward in faith. I was thinking about the fact that many Scholars might argue that our lives are the sum total of many small decisions and a few large choices. I was doing some research and I, I found a psychological study about 10 years ago that said the average American makes 350,000 decisions each day. 350,000 decisions, Catherine. And 226 of these decisions, scholars say, are about what should we eat. <laughs> Think about all of the decisions that we make. Should I wear these jeans or should I wear this skirt? Should I cross this street by running, skipping, or jogging, <laughs> right? Do, do, do I sit here or do I sit there? Do I repair the refrigerator or do I pay the taxes? Do, what, and, and I am wondering about the larger questions. Do I mend this damaged relationship? Do I start this job or do I leave this job? Do I forgive or do I sit in anger? How do we move forward in faith with all of these questions circling within our heads. For this reason, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Philippians. The first chapter, verses 9 and 10. And in this sermon, we will reflect on what really matters. And I will do my best to provide with you a faith-forward formula to determine what really matters. This scripture that I will read is a translation from the Common English Bible. And in this interpretation of the scripture, there is this word 
become. And so I will replace this word become because it doesn't quite capture the essence of what the Greek word perisuo, everybody say it with me, perisuo. Perisuo means abundance. It means to overflow. It means to extend beyond. Become just doesn't get there for us. And so we will change this word just for this scripture, to grow. Please hear these words from the Apostle Paul. As he was sitting in a jail cell, perhaps somewhere in Rome, writing this letter to the people of Philippi. This is my prayer. That your love may grow more and more rich in knowledge and all kinds of insight. <laughs> I pray this so that you will be able to decide, Brother Washington, what really matters. I, I was talking to a friend about this. We could just say this scripture over and over again and then we could say amen and go because it's enough there. I, I, Jimmy, my prayer is that your love will grow more and more rich in knowledge and all kinds of insight. I pray this, Antoinette, so that you may be able to decide what really matters. What really matters. Most gracious God, We give you thanks for this day. We have no control over what happened yesterday. As much as we plan, we cannot predict what will happen tomorrow. And so we give you thanks for this day. We thank you for these people who have gathered to, to, to begin to reflect on how they might move their faith forward on this day. We give thanks for these people who are wrestling, wrestling with thousands upon thousands of questions because decisions will be made on this day. Decisions that will affect generations to come will be made on this day. So dear God, we pray now that your spirit might guide us. We pray that your spirit might guide us and give us clarity of thought, that you would connect our mind and our heart so that we might walk in step in love with the way that you have taught us in your scripture. Dear God, allow my words to be your words, that they might fall upon the fertile hearts of your people such that something beautiful might take root and we might leave this place forever changed, even if it's in some small way, so that we can decide what really matters. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus, the great counselor. Let all the saints of God say amen. What really matters? What we'll do for the next several minutes is we will walk through this scripture together. We'll take our time with it. I don't preach very often, so I got a few things to say. My prayer is my prayer is, 
Let us remember the, con the, the context and the conditions of Paul's prayer to the church of Philippi. See, Paul had a strong connection with this church. It was a church that he planted in, in, in the city of Philippi somewhere around 49-52 A.D. And as we could tell in the introductory verses of Philippians, he cared deeply about these folk, Mr. Clark. Yet, we know that when Paul was scribing this letter, he was sitting in prison. He was suffering, and suffering was not new for Paul. Throughout his long ministry, he was whipped, Anaya. He was beaten with rods. He was hunted by assassins. Demarcus, he was stoned and left for dead. And now, Paul is in prison. We also know that Paul was human. And if he was human and he was sitting in prison, at some point he, he was likely depressed. He was likely alone. He was likely despairing. He recognized that at any moment, soon me, his life could be snuffed out. It could be taken away. And so he was writing this letter from a place of crisis, Jay. It was no ordinary letter. And so that we might imagine, Jay, as, as he was writing, he was thinking about all of the layers that are relationships in his life. He was, he was writing this, this prayer for the church in Philippi, but it just wasn't the church in Philippi. He was writing this letter to specific people. He could see their faces, people that he missed. He saw Will in his eyes. He saw Kevin in his eyes. He saw he, he saw Jesse in his eyes. He saw Darren in his eyes. He was envisioning people. He wasn't just writing for a random church. But <laughs> there are a couple preachers in this space, Helen. And I know as a preacher that sometimes when you pray a prayer and when you preach a sermon, it's not only for the people that you're praying for. You're praying for yourself. You're preaching so you can get a word. This word has been teaching me for weeks. And so in this moment, in this prison, Paul is not only praying for the church. He's not only praying for specific people, mama. He's praying for himself. Huh. But what amazes me most is that with all of these layers of prayer, Paul was praying for generations that he could not even see. <laughs> Delano, let, 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 me, let, me, let me say a little bit more about that, right? He wrote this prayer in 50 AD to a church in Philippi that he believed would continue. But would he have believed that we would be reading the same scripture in 2022? He was writing this prayer for those that were not yet born. This is a prayer that is rooted in the future. It was a faith forward kind of prayer. So, I often tell these stories about my grandparents because they were some of the greatest teachers that I ever met. My mom gets uh, a little upset with me about telling these stories because she says they stretch the imagination at times. My granddaddy had a fourth grade education. Doc Key was from Holmes County, Mississippi. Y'all notice I didn't say Mississippi. He's from Holmes County, Mississippi. My grandfather was a sharecropper. He picked cotton. He was the 11th of 12 children. And everybody in his family, Doc, picked cotton. 
His siblings picked cotton. His daddy picked cotton. His granddaddy picked cotton. His great-great-granddaddy picked cotton. Cotton was what they knew. It was really troubling to me when I learned that as a child, my granddaddy was not allowed to leave the plantation. Think about that. <laughs> my grandfather born in the 1920s on a cotton plantation that he could not leave. Sounds a lot like slavery to me. Yet, when my grandparents had their first baby, the doctor handed the baby over to my granddad. And he said, none of my children will ever pick a piece of cotton. And they will all go to college. How does one pray over a baby? that they will not pick a piece of cotton and all go to college and all you know is cotton. All your people knew was cotton and you ain't never met a Negro that went to college. Faith forward. Paul is offering a faith forward prayer just like my granddad. My prayer is that your love will grow more and more rich. I need some helpers. Uh, will, Clark, Gregory, Jalen, Darren, please come up. Delano, could you help me? Y'all, please come on up. Don't, get, don't be shy now. Uh, Delano, Grace, come on up, please. Jimmy, I need your help. Okay. How does love grow? How does love grow? How, how does love grow? So I'm going to ask if you all could stand in a circle. Um, and Delano, I'm going to ask that you stand in the center of the circle. Everybody, how does love grow? Say it with me. How does love grow? I think I'm going to show you how love grows. Right? Now, I'm going to ask... This is my friend since the age of six. That's Floyd Wood. I'm going to ask now, so you, you, you're going to be the portion of torture right now. I, I'm going to ask that each of you in the circle would turn your back to Floyd. Please turn your back to Floyd. And I'd like for you to cross your arms. Cross your arms. So I, I, I want to teach just a, a, a very small Cliff Notes version of how Howard Thurman, the great philosopher, theologian, mystic teacher, talked about love. And he said, in order to understand love, you must also understand hate, soon me. And so in this particular reflection that Howard, talks of, Howard Thurman talks about growing in love of others, he says, that this is the evolution of hate. Hear me, friends. The first step in the development of hate is contact without fellowship. Contact. We live in the same neighborhood. We go to the same school. We drive on the same highways. But I have no fellowship with you. And that leads to a sense of coldness to your neighbor. And Doc, when there is no fellowship, there begins to erode a sense of sympathy. So if I have no, con no, no, no meaningful fellowship with you, I'm not only cold towards you, but I lose my sympathy towards you. And when my sympathy goes, because you're different than me, even though we're in common space, even though you may live outside of my church, even though you may vote a little differently, because I have no fellowship with you, I lack sympathy, now I can begin 
small processes of ill will towards you. I can look the other way when you need something. When you ask me a question, I can act as if I don't know the answer. When you invite me into conversation, I can say my schedule is full because you don't believe the way that I do. And so when I get to this point of commission, then I can move my brain to active ill will. So now, please don't hurt them. If you're in that circle, I'm going to ask that you start just kicking backwards. Just kick backwards, kick backwards, right? When you get to a point where you are in contact with out fellowship, keep kicking. <laughs> when you get to a point where you're in contact with out fellowship, you lose a sense of sympathy, then you can get to a place where you can actively do ill will to another. That is hatred, according to Thurman. Are we clear? We clear? We're talking about growing in love. Now I'm going to invite you all to turn around. Everybody has on their mask, right? So now I'm going to ask that you just allow your elbows to touch each other. According to Thurman, love is contact with fellowship. Do y'all see this image? Love begins when we are in fellowship with people who may be different from us, but we recognize them as made in the image of God. And when you are in fellowship and contact, you can offer sympathy to your neighbor even if they are different from you. So now I'm going to ask that you reach out your hand towards Floyd. And even though they are different from you, you're offering sympathy and this builds goodwill. My prayer is that you will grow more and more rich in love. Right? My prayer is that your, your love will grow so that we can reach out and be in fellowship even with those who vote differently than us, who, who, who love differently than us, who believe differently than us, that live differently than us. My prayer is that your love will grow. Thank you all. I'll be done in a couple minutes. My prayer is that your love will grow more and more rich in knowledge and insight. DeMarcus, in knowledge and insight. This old lady in South Georgia told me, Ms. Washington, she said, the longest journey you will take in life is the trip from your head to your heart. Knowledge and insight. Knowledge is book learning. Insight is wisdom from practical living. Knowledge is theory. Insight is practice. Knowledge is head. Insight is heart. My prayer is that your love will grow more and more in knowledge and insight. But how often? <laughs> Reverend Smothers, how often, how often do we think and not act? I'm saying something. I, I know if I was in the Baptist church, folks would be throwing stuff. How often do we think and not act? How often do we write about, read about, pray about, think about 
how to love our neighbors, but when somebody is in need of compassion, we just think about it and move our way. Howard Thurman says that the greatest calamity of the Christian church is that we have made love into a theory. How often do we act and not think, Will? How often do we move away from strangers? How often do we choose not to pray and be in relationship with people who are different than us? How often do we disregard this is what Jesus would do? My prayer is that your love will grow more and more in knowledge and in sight, in theory and action, in wisdom and practice, in head and heart. My prayer My prayer is that your love will grow more and more in knowledge and insight. I pray this so that you can decide what really matters. So how do we decide what really matters? <laughs> how do we decide what really matters? I've been sitting with Thurman for a while. He's a good teacher and friend. And Davis, Dr. Thurman says that when you are facing some of those really critical decisions on your 30, 350,000 decisions in a day, if it's a real hard decision and you need to face it, the way that you face that decision, Jay, is to put really at the end of the question. Put really. Really is an intensifier, right? Do I love this person really? <laughs> Who am I really? Do I want to forgive? Really? Is this relationship life giving to me? Really? Am I living the way that God would have me to live? Really? There's another way we can begin to process what really matters. And I'm almost done. It's to think about are our decisions grounded in humility? Brad, <clears throat> about Four years ago, I was at an academic conference. And some of you all have been to academic conferences. And Kevin, I, I promise you, you don't go into an academic conference expecting to be transformed internally. But on this particular conference, it was a panel on humility. And one of the panelists was a Buddhist monk. And the Buddhist monk, Jonathan, he sat on the panel and he gave this definition of humility that forever changed my life. He said, some people think of humility as the opposite of arrogance, right? You're not boasting about who you are. You're humble. He said, other people think about humility 
as self-deprecation. I'm not as good. Yeah, I mean, you know, people give you compliments. Oh, you know, I'm not that cool. You know, oh, you know. And you, you pull it in. But this Buddhist monk said, Doc, and, and this changed my life. This Buddhist monk said that humility is an accurate assessment of your gifts. It's an accurate assessment of your gifts. If you are Kevin Durant, you don't have to tell everybody, oh, I can hoop, <laughs> right? And you don't also have to say, I'm not that good. I can accurately say I'm one of the best in the world at what I do. But even as you can accurately assess what you can do, you must also recognize what you cannot do. How do we make decisions that really matter? We recognize what we can do and we give the rest to God. So here is our faith formula for moving forward. First, we must root our prayers in belief that what we are speaking life to will impact generations not yet born. Are we praying just for our well-being? Are we praying for those who have yet to breathe a breath? When somebody founded this church 175 years ago, they may not have thought that it would last for 200 years, but they did think that somebody's grandchildren would be in these pews. What is rooting your prayers? Secondly, we must embody God's love in our schools, in our churches, in our neighborhoods, in our families, even in this place of racial trauma and political divisiveness caused by this pandemic. We invite you to embody God's love and reach out to those who vote differently to those who, who read scripture differently and those who read scripture not at all. Embody God's love. This will root our faith as we move forward. Friends, we must connect head and heart. There's some seminarians in here. You write long papers, but do you live out what you write? There's some teachers in here who teach young people one thing and they go home and do something else, but how do we connect God and heart? Head and heart, knowledge and insight. And finally, we must be aware that only our sentient bodies can do so much. Let us be humble and accurately assess what we can do and give the rest to God. Beloved, my prayer is that your love will grow, that it will grow more and more rich. in knowledge and insight. I pray this to you, my friend, so that you might decide what really matters. My prayer is that your love will grow, that your love will grow more and more rich, in knowledge and insight. Our grandkids, our great-grandkids are counting on it. I pray this so you might decide in your life what really, what really matters. May God bless you on the long and arduous journey from your head to your heart. Amen.
Oh, come on, you can do better than that. The Lord has spoken through God's servant this morning. Let us bless the Lord for the servant of God and for this formula of how to move forward in our faith. Preacher, I don't know why they don't invite you more. You'll be coming back. <laughs> you blessed us this morning. You taught us. You challenged us. You blessed us. And for this, we give God all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Friends, I hope this week that you will be praying this prayer. I hope this week as we go forward from this place that you will be asking God and seeking God for this love that overflows, right? For more and more knowledge and more and more insight. More and more. So that we can determine what really matters. Today we will leave this place and go um, to, the, to the back of the church to celebrate with our community partners. Our partners are in worship today. If you uh, will stand from West Path, Lazarus, um, I'm having a senior moment, somebody help me, Mac and Wellroot. Uh, and any of our other community partners that will hear, if you will stand today so that we might recognize you, we are so grateful for you. I know some have already moved outside. Um, I'll tell you today that um, I'm especially excited that Wellroot is here. Wellroot is our children's home. And Miss Virginia Howard used to be in charge of the children's home yard sale, one of their biggest fundraisers every year. And this church has been deeply involved with the children's home now, Wellroot, for years and years and years. Sharon, it's so good to see you. Um, and so many others because we we don't just come here to worship. We don't just come here to get what we need, preacher. We come here to serve others, to grow together, and to engage the city in, of Atlanta and beyond. And that's what we'll do as we continue to move forward in faith. So I'm going to ask you to um, not stop at the doors here or there today, but let's move. We've got food for you, um, some family fun, and uh, lots of opportunity to get involved in the community, even if you are not looking to be involved in the church. Um, we're here to connect you to be the hands and feet of Christ in this world. Amen? Amen. Next week, Saturday, is Dragon Con. Engage the city of Atlanta and beyond. Let me tell you, if you're a Dragon Con fan, this is the best place to watch the parade. So be here Saturday, 10 o'clock. We'll be giving out water and comics and engaging with the community and worship on Sunday. You are welcome to, to wear your costume or t-shirt um, with your favorite character on it. And um, I'm not sure how I'm going to follow that, but I think I'm back in the saddle next week, um, Doc, <laughs> as we continue to move this faith forward. I can't wait to see you Saturday at 10 and in worship at 10 uh, next week. Thank you, thank you, thank you to the committee, the 175-year anniversary committee that has put all of this together. I am so grateful to all of you and um, look forward to what the next two months will bring. If this is your first time at Atlanta First, please don't make it your last time. We're so glad to have you with us. We can't wait for you to get involved in this city and beyond. You are always welcome here and always welcome to participate in the ministries through this church. And for the next two months, we're celebrating 175 years. Bishop Sue will be here in a couple weeks. President Finvez from Emory University will be here in a couple weeks. And so many other impactful folks. Don't miss out on what's going on. All right, stand to receive this benediction. Come on, worship team. Now as we go forth from this place, 
we do not go forth from the presence of God. As we go forth from this place, we do not leave behind our responsibility to move forward in faith. As we go forward from this place, we don't stop praying for God to give us more and more and more knowledge and insight so that we might discern what matters most. As we go forth from this place, we go forth expecting to experience God in our lives and expecting to be God's instrument of transformation in this place. So let us sing together. Let the church sing.